Welcome back to Reading Bear. Today, we will take a look at some new Mauritius compliance stories. And if you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. Let's go! The first one is titled, The Day I Lit an Ambulance on Fire. Several years ago I was working as an EMT for a small private ambulance company which contracted primarily as a transportation service. The ambulance company employed a pair of mechanics that did regular maintenance on each unit and fixed problems when they came up. The company's CEO was pretty stingy when it came to money so the rigs were old and a lot of the mechanics' spare time went towards restoring the Impala owned by the CEO's son. I wasn't well liked by the owners and management for one reason or another but I suspect it's because I frequently spoke my mind. This means that I was tasked with the worst trucks on the worst shifts. One day my partner and I were dispatched to a scheduled patient transfer from a long-term rehabilitation facility to their home. On our way to the facility our ambulance overheated and we were forced to pull over. Dispatch was notified and we were told to let them know when the truck cooled so we could get back to work. An hour later the truck was still hotter than I'd like and I let dispatch know that we needed a new unit. Their solution was to have us drive back and swap our gear into a fresh unit to finish our shift. We would need to drive across town to get back to dispatch so I let them know that it would take a while as we'd need to pull over every time the engine overheated. Little else was discussed and we started back. I figured I'd stick to the smaller side roads and take my time avoiding the freeways for the safety of ourselves and other drivers sharing the road. I should also mention that every ambulance has a GPS reporting system that reports all of our telemetry so we're tracked every moment of every day. The moment we passed the first entrance to the freeway the dispatch manager, we'll call her Mary, calls us on the radio and angrily asks us to explain why we're not following instructions. I opted to give her a phone call to settle this and not have a long drawn out discussion on the public airwaves. Mary accuses my partner and me of wasting time and milking the situation so we wouldn't have to take our share of calls. Mary goes on saying that our intentions were obvious since we're not taking the freeway and as such, when we got back to dispatch, we would be dismissed for the remainder of the day without pay and they would investigate to see if further disciplinary actions would be needed. I tried to let her know that driving on the freeway was unsafe and I would have to stop more frequently but she wouldn't hear it and told me to get back as fast as possible, no more delays. Q Malicious Compliance Our patient monitoring equipment is incredibly expensive and management has stated in the past that if we break it we're on the hook to replace it. So I tell my partner to pack it all up and put it just inside the side door because I wasn't sure what would happen but chances were good that we'd need to grab it quickly and make a run for it. So, as directed, we turn around and head back to the freeway entrance at full speed. I think we made it to the end of the freeway merging lane when the temperature gauge started to redline and we had another 12 miles to go. The further I drove, the hotter the engine got and it started to produce white smoke. Lightly at first then heavier as we approached the big hill just before our freeway exit. Several cars were passing us and honking their horns to alert us of our peril but there was no stopping this train. We were filling up the lanes behind us with smoke and the smell was wretched but the ambulance was still running. As we made it to the top of the hill the engine cut out and lost all power. Smoke was pouring out of the sides of the hood but my vision wasn't compromised so I coasted it over to the shoulder and got it as far off the road as I could safely manage. Once I threw it into park flames erupted from the engine. I told my partner to get as much equipment evacuated as she could and I grabbed the fire extinguisher. As I'm trying to put out the fire, my partner is on the phone letting dispatch know that we were forced to stop because our ambulance was on its way to a fiery death. I guess at this point our situation had received enough attention that someone had called 911 and the fire department was dispatched but they pulled up on the opposite side of the freeway watching to make sure that things didn't spiral out of control. We were sure to let dispatch know that the fire department had also arrived. Shortly after our call the CEO's son showed up in his Impala to pick up the equipment as well as myself and my partner. He was on the phone trying to get a flatbed tow truck out as fast as possible so his smoking ambulance could be removed from public view as quickly as possible. The unit was picked up and towed back to the garage all while the fire department sat and watched. 
My partner and I were still sent home for the rest of the day. I celebrated the early start to my weekend with a few drinks and nothing else ever came of it. That unit was retired and never saw service after that but the mechanics said they owed me a beer I guess because I brought the end to the worst rig in the fleet and they no longer needed to provide upkeep on it. The next one is titled, New Company Commander Requires Soldiers to Wear Ties with Civilian Clothing While on Tour. I was in a US Army band stationed in Germany in the early 90s. We performed a lot of concerts and events for the public all over the region, usually traveling by bus. Normally we would wear civilian clothing while traveling, then change into a formal military uniform after we arrived, unpacked, and set up for the event. Our normal requirement for civilian clothing was pretty informal, similar to what you might wear in an office in the US. Men had to wear a shirt with a collar, so lots of us wore polo shirts. Jeans were acceptable as long as they were clean and no holes, no hats, etc. I had been there about six months when we got a new company commander. In a band, the commander is a warrant officer, and also conducts the band, runs rehearsals, picks music, all that fun stuff. He had been with the unit about two weeks, and went along with us on a short two to three day tour to play some concerts for German civilians. When we returned, he started making changes. Most were pretty minor and expected, like what music would be performed. But the biggest change was to our travel dress code. All male soldiers would be required to wear a tie when on tour. Never mind that many of these kids were rather young and didn't even own one other than the flat black tie issued with our Class A uniforms. The next trip was only a few days away, and we had better show up ready to go with ties on. And that's when me and my roommate decided to have a little fun. We went to the local thrift shop and bought up all the ugly ties we could find. Paisley ties, Christmas ties, ties with Hawaiian hula girls on them. Thin neon colored 80s ties, super wide 70s ties, even a few plaid bow ties. Over the next few days, we handed them out to nearly every person in the unit, including a few women who wanted to get in on the fun. Tour departure day arrives, and we have our morning formation in the band hall, all standing in rows, dressed and ready to depart, new ties worn. The first sergeant is wearing a lovely hula girl tie, and grins a bit as he goes over all the usual formalities, everyone present, all equipment ready to go, last minute instructions, blah blah blah, then calls the company commander in. The new commander steps inside the band hall and freezes. He looks slowly down the lines of soldiers, biting his lip, like he's trying very hard not to say something. He backs out of the room, still not saying a word. About a minute later, he returns, looks right at the first sergeant, and says, everything ready to go? Yes sir. Right. Let's hit it. The tour went off without any problems, but the requirement to wear ties was dropped as soon as we got back. Some of us still wore them occasionally for fun. The next one is titled, This is not an undershirt. Having read a couple of these military stories it reminded me of my time in Fort Gordon. This was back in 1990 I had a very long AIT, Advanced Individual Training, course. 29 years, Satellite Communication Systems Repairer, Operator. It was 10 months long and after 2 months we were allowed to wear civilian clothes. One day several of us went to the mess hall wearing our brown army issued undershirts and jeans. The sergeant at the door wouldn't let us in because we were wearing undershirts, we asked him what the difference between an undershirt and a t-shirt was. He explained that t-shirts have writing on them. No problem. We acquired a black sharpie and wrote this is not an undershirt across each other's chests and went back. A brief argument ensued, but he let us in. This became our unofficial uniform for the mess hall. The next one is titled, It's usually not a good idea to piss off the person who keeps the department ahead of schedule. So I work for a grocery store as a personal shopper for their in-house grocery pickup and delivery service. Not to toot my own horn but I am uncontestedly the fastest and best employee in the entire day shift. For context I can pick around 100 to 120 unique items per hour while the average person does around 60. It's safe to say that this department relies on me quite heavily. To the point where the department manager has to find two people to replace me when I can't come to a shift. This is mainly because I find the job pretty boring so I throw in an airpod and listen to music. 
I'm fast mainly because it makes me feel like I'm actually doing something while I'm here. It's also important to note that there's no incentive for me to perform more than anyone else, I don't get paid more, there's no recognition, I just do it because it keeps me busy. Now one of the assistant store managers doesn't like me. I can't figure out the reason but she doesn't. Either way she decided today that it would now be a rule that you couldn't listen to music while picking groceries as they didn't know what you were listening to, nothing in relation to not being able to hear customers, which I could anyways. Now I asked others about this tile and they hadn't been told anything and were still wearing earbuds and listening to music. It's important for us to have at least a one hour buffer, it allows us to call customers to review changes made to their order and then adjust anything as per their request. This is how we ensure their satisfaction. Today it was really busy, we could barely keep that buffer with me at full productivity, which I was until being told no more music. That's when things began to nosedive, and fast. Within half an hour we had lost half of our buffer and by the time I was done my pick, we had completely lost it. This ASM is now being chewed out by the GM because we're behind and that's a serious issue. She then looks at the chart that shows our pick rates and asks him where I am, explaining that we shouldn't be behind with me there. All the while I'm sitting there taking my sweet butt time writing bin tags until she confronts me as to why I'm picking so slowly. I explained that I had no obligation to go above and beyond and that because there was a clear double standard being held, I didn't see a reason to perform at a higher level than the rest of the department. After the cogs in her head finally stopped turning she realized that it is probably best if she allows me to listen to my music and sends me on my way. Within two hours I've created us an hour buffer again. Needless to say she learned an important lesson in cause and effect today that I doubt she'll be forgetting soon. The next one is titled, Truck Parade. This would have occurred in the first few years of this century. At the time I was working for one of our largest supermarket chains in a 24-hour warehouse, usual three-shift pattern. I was the union rep for the night shift, and the usual procedure was that no new orders were to be started after around 5.45. This was sensible as it allowed plenty of time for returning picking trucks in good time for the early shift to book them out prior to starting work, as well as giving the outgoing night shift time to wash up before clocking out. Before carrying on with this tale I should add that all picking work attracted a bonus payment according to time allotted to a pick measured against time taken to complete and picking accuracy. This could make a significant difference to one's pay. Furthermore any pick that could not be completed by the end of the shift would be handed over to one of the early shift, who could then poodle about as slow as they liked knowing they'd be paid 100% bonus, same for whoever had handed the pick over, hence the 545 cutoff for taking a new assignment. Around 2005 the company brought in several new managers across the three shifts who'd never worked for the business before, a departure from what had been in place successfully for many years, in that all management had worked in the warehouse and knew the job inside out. One of the new intakes decided to mend something that wasn't broken in the first place and decreed that no picking truck be returned for the early shift before 5.55. I'm glad to report now that these new rules lasted exactly one shift. At the start of the shift I went round speaking to every picker telling them to make sure they were well in front bonus wise by the time they picked up their last assignment and ensure that they didn't complete it. At 5.55 the next morning a convoy of 50 or so picking trucks rattled across the floor, all sounding their horns on the way to the drop off point, every picker then had to hand back the key and ensure that their 100% bonus payment was logged before the unfinished pick could be assigned to an early shift picker, who also had to ensure they'd be logged for their bonus payment. The only downside for the night shift was that many got out late that morning, but things were back to normal the next day, especially after the early shift adopted the same tactic. In ending I have to say that this particular warehouse was run very smoothly, staff and management alike, and it was never a question of trying to get something for nothing, we worked hard and were paid well. Just another example of how bad management can turn a good job bad. The next one is titled, I can't wear this? This will not end well. This happened back in 07, 08. So the place I worked at had a uniform, grey, red stripped button up shirt, black pants, black boots. They also didn't bother to replace old uniforms, I had a shirt that was ripped from the collar to the bottom of the shirt, and they were okay with me wearing it. 
A few years before that we had a different shirt and had shorts given to us. So like most weeks they were working us hard, 6 day work week, 70 hours, fun times. On the one day off I hadn't done laundry, don't remember why, maybe I was sick or just being lazy. So I didn't have any of the buttoned up shirts clean. So I go in with my old work shirt. This shirt was red, had three buttons on the collar, and had the company name printed on one side from the collar down to about where it would still be visible after being tucked in. I go in to talk to my supervisor and this happens. Me is me. S is supervisor. S, what are you wearing? Me, old uniform, none of the greys are clean. S, you can't wear that. You have to wear the greys. Me, I can't. None of them are clean. This is all I have. S, I don't care. Go home and put on one of your greys. Me, so let me get this straight. I can't wear this clean shirt that still company approved? And you want me to go and get one of my greys that have been sitting in my dirt clothes basket for a week? He meekly nods. Me, I got a better idea. I have one of the greys in my truck. It's been in there for like three weeks. How about I wear that one? S, um, no that's. Me, I cut him off, no, no, I get it have to wear the greys, right? S, what if I give you one of my shirts? Me, you weigh about 100 pounds more than me and are like 6 inches shorter than me. Besides did you bring an extra? He looks embarrassed. So yeah. I'm going to go ahead and wear the grey that hasn't been washed in 3 weeks. And I did. And I made sure all my stores heard the story. He never questioned my uniform again. The last one is titled, Are you sure you want me to get rid of my server that you use daily? Have fun dealing with the aftermath. I worked for a large consumer electronics retailer for many years as technical support. I was also in charge of all of the internal devices and computers employees used at my location. Not the computers that were on demo for customers to use comes into play later. The retail stores offered technical support for computers and mobile devices. Now for technical support there were two laptops that I was authorized to configure for use by technicians, load useful software and allow admin privileges. One such useful tool is called RecBoot. This application was freeware, I checked the license, and not an internal tool. Back in the days when iDevices had a physical home button, to put the device in recovery mode, the home and power button would need to be pressed. RecBoot allowed a connected device to be put in recovery mode by clicking the recovery mode button. Easy and simple. A lot of devices had this home button stop working. When you were able to access the device, assistive touch could be used for a virtual home button. If the device passcode was forgotten or too many attempts were made and the device was permanently locked a restore was needed. To do this the device must be put in recovery mode. Important for later. Two laptops with sometimes dozens of customers looking for support and needing to restore iDevices or reset account passwords was not great. Obviously customers would get impatient having to wait longer for support. This was brought up to management. Their solution, well there are tons of demo computers, connect the devices and do restores from them. There you go, Bob's your uncle. These demo computers were loaded with a demo image and configured that any changes made would be reverted when the computer was restarted, also the admin password was a guarded secret, I had the password but was definitely not allowed to share it. To run RecBoot after it had been downloaded from the internet required the admin password. So it only worked for restores. So to do a restore each demo computer would have to download the restore image, many GB of download, and it would take 20 plus minutes just to download one, not even complete a restore. Each device model would need a specific restore image. You can imagine this was not ideal but to management, hey, it works, problem solved, what I started doing was I would unfreeze a few computers, transfer all of the needed restore images onto them from a local server and freeze them again. I would also transfer RecBoot, launch it, and enter the admin password so it wouldn't require it again later. This server was on the public network and therefore was not managed by the remote IT team as an internal computer and had no corporate policies installed. There was no confidential information on it. I had passed this by the appropriate channels and was given some guidelines to follow. 
if all was followed I was allowed to have the server running. Everyone seemed to think it was a great idea and it really helped. It was a lot of upkeep. Every time a new software update was released I would have to unfreeze, transfer and then refreeze the computers. If a new demo image was installed on the computers I would have to redo it as well. It would take a few hours to get done. I was happy to do it, it saved a lot of time in the end and we were able to offer better service to customers. Well, the person in charge of the demo computers did not like it. Apparently corporate didn't either. I was told I could not modify the demo computers in any way. I came up with a solution, with the server already running I would share the logins with the technical support team. I could grant admin access on the server, they could run the tools needed, more specifically rec boot, and should a restore image be needed they could transfer it locally over the network to the demo computer they were using, much faster. All was well until we got a new lead technician. Jeb. Now unlike other stories Jeb was not an external hire but a technician who had been promoted. We had worked together for a few years at this point and he was actually a decent guy. I'm not sure if the power went to his head, he just wanted to impress upper management, or if he was being pressured by management but after being promoted he became a different person. Suddenly he was the boss and things were done his way and that was that. During a physical inventory of the store it was noted that my server was not a managed internal server nor was it a demo unit for customers. As such it needed to be decommissioned and the hardware returned to the warehouse. Jeb brings this to my attention as I am the one who takes care of internal devices. He asks that I make it gone by the end of the next day. I pointed out that I had followed the guidelines and that he knew full well how useful this was. I brought up that it would impact his metrics on customer wait time and satisfaction. Something I'm sure he was hoping to improve. He wouldn't have it. He cited that any computer on the network needed to be managed and my server was no longer approved. He also let me know that the two laptops that were being used by the technicians were going to have an image installed on them and now be managed units. I tried to argue, at least for my server, and he threatened to write me up. All right, I'll let you dig your own grave. He also sent out an email to the whole technical support team pretty much forbidding the use of any non-approved software. I wiped my server and sent it back to the warehouse. Without my server and now the two laptops being managed no one had an admin password except me and the IT team who was remote and tickets were usually only responded to in 24 to 48 hours but being managed no unapproved software could be installed anyways. Cue the next night, first day without the server, when I get a call from Jeb in a panic, asking how he could get Recboot working and he really needed it. I had the pleasure of telling him that the server was gone and no unapproved software could be installed. As per company policy the admin password could not be provided unless a ticket was opened with IT and his need for it was approved. Which was likely to take a few days, if it was even approved. Turns out a customer started throwing a fit. Not only one but multiple people over the course of the day and each time it was escalated to him to deal with. Each time having my server would have put a swift end to the problem. This particular customer had an iPhone that was about a year and a half, only one year of warranty, and the home button stopped working. They had been in previously and were given the options of the virtual home button, free, paying for a replacement phone, a few hundred dollars, or buying a brand new phone. Repairing the home button was not a repair offered. They had opted for the free option. This time the customer's kid had played with the phone, entered the passcode wrong and the phone was disabled. Of course the customer doesn't have iCloud set up or a recent backup. So no remote wipe and no way of backing up the info. To top it off they would have to spend hundreds of dollars for a replacement phone or buy a brand new one. Having had the phone less than two years their phone contract was not up for renewal with their cell phone provider. Needless to say the customer was pissed. After that day customer satisfaction and wait times tanked. He had to deal with a lot more escalations. He definitely was not looking good in the eyes of management. After a few months he was demoted back to technician. I didn't advocate to bring my solutions back. I left the company shortly after. Thanks for listening.